Hello, my friends. Can you believe it? Episode number 18 of the Gardening Simplified Show. Episode one of the new year 2023. Thanks for joining us. She is Stacy Hervella. I'm Rick Weist, and Adriana Robinson, our producer and engineer, joins us here in the beautiful studios. Look at that. The beautiful studios of Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Stacy, Happy New Year. Happy New Year and happy first show of 2023. I'm looking forward to 2023 and we hope that you are too. Of course, we want to remind you to make sure to visit GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. And Stacy, we'd love to have folks also subscribe and watch us on YouTube. Yes, and if they're joining us on YouTube, they're seeing the fabulous new backdrop that we yes. have in the studio today. We have invested in seasonal backdrops uh, to, you know, because this is a gardening show. Mm -hmm. So we got to be seasonal. We got to, you know, work with a change of season. So we have a beautiful winter scene, which I can't believe I'm saying it's a beautiful winter scene because winter is <laughs> far and away my least favorite season. I'm and, with you uh, but as far as winter goes, this, this picture is pretty nice. A winter wonderland. Well, to kick things off for 2023, we thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, trends in the garden. Gardening trends, of course, Stacy, they change uh, every year. Some trends have a tendency to stay the same. I know one I'm excited about this year is uh, I'm an Apollo age boy. Uh, you know, I was close to 10 years old when Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon. But moon gardens, according to Google Trends, uh, that's a, a phrase that is searched, and there's a lot of interest in moon gardens, white flowers, especially for uh, for the evening hours, how they show up. See, I thought you were talking about gardening with seeds that had been to the moon oh. and uh, wasn't really sure how that was going to work out. But, yeah, the, the white flower thing makes perfect sense because – in the evening, when the moon is shining and you have no lights, the white flowers really shine out from the darkness. And I think, uh, you know, the rise of popularity of moon gardens, not only is it beautiful and romantic and interesting, and of course, easy to pick plants because mm -hmm. you're mostly picking plants with white flowers and in silver foliage, uh, is that people work. People work really hard and they don't have a chance to relax in their garden yeah. until night. And so when you're designing a garden specifically for that time, when you are most able to enjoy it, you're going to get a lot more out of it. Absolutely. Another trend for 2023 is, uh, well, there's a housing shortage in many parts of the country. And uh, along with that, ooh, an increase in interest rates. And so there are a number of people who are thinking, you know, this place isn't so bad. I think I'm going to stick around for a little while. And when they do that, Stacy, they start looking at the yard and garden and, uh, and doing some planting, including, uh, you know, if it's a smaller yard in a smaller space, and that's an interest right now, small space gardening, uh, things that grow vertically, or a great example is Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs Purple Pillar. Ooh, the landscape plant of the year yeah. is, is for 2023 is Purple Pillar. And that is a fastidget Rose of Sharon. Now, I didn't see that she had a word for the day, but maybe fastidget will be that, that very word. Very good word. Um, it, it is a very useful word. It doesn't just apply to the plant kingdom, but fastidget means a variety that grows tall and narrow like a column. Now, yes, people also use the word column. Um, so where fastidious is appropriate versus column is probably just depending on how pedantic you actually want to be. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. The year has just started. I'm going to start using fastidious instead of narrow and column. But you yeah. know, that I use them interchangeably. You often do see the cultivar fastidiata on um, plants that have that. So, for example, the um, fastidious English oak uh, is, is uh, I believe the cultivar is fastidiata, but um, it is a fastidious Rose of Sharon. So compared to another Rose of Sharon, which is uh, has a big kind of oval shape, can be eight or more feet Get wide. Get out of control sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, take up more than its space. Yeah. Uh, purple pillar stays a pretty tidy four to five feet, but 10 to 16 feet tall. So that's where that sort of tall and narrow habit comes in. So it's a great space saver and really nice as a flowering hedge. Of course, it's not going to provide year round privacy right. because it's not an evergreen, but in summer, it's going to look absolutely amazing. Folks, we'll talk more about Purple Pillar and the National Plants of the Year as the show progresses through the year. Some fabulous National Plants of the Year to talk about this year. We're going to introduce you to them so you use them in your yard and your garden. 
abundant gardens is another trend. In other words, less about curb appeal and more about the usefulness of plants. And a great example of that is a trend called flower farming. And you're saying, well, I don't have enough property to flower farm. Yes, you do. If you have a little sunny spot growing some cosmos, some gomphrena, some daisies, where you can cut and come again and Stacy brings some fresh flowers into the house, flower farming. You know, flower farming is probably one of the fastest growing segments in the horticulture industry right now. Not just for home gardeners, but in uh, for people who are starting businesses sure. too. You know, we've seen a huge interest in that. And really, yes, it's wonderful to have your own fruit and vegetables and herbs in your backyard. But I'll tell you, when you start having your own cut flower garden, that's luxury. You know, yeah. when you no longer have to go and shell out for a bouquet and you're just picking something from the backyard and you have friends over and they say, oh my gosh, look at these beautiful flowers. And you just casually say, oh yeah, I I grew those. Uh, that's that's a lot of fun. I encourage everyone to try it. And, you know, flower gardening isn't just, you, you named some wonderful annuals, Cosmos. I mean, you can't go wrong mm-hmm. with Cosmos. But um, there's so many different things that you can grow. And even things that you already have in your yard might actually be pretty suitable for, for cutting. People just don't tend to approach their yards that way. You've got it. Flower farming. It makes the cut. Uh, Another trend, uh, you know, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, they put Greece on the map. Greece is the word, but I'm talking about the country Greece. Things Greek or Mediterranean gardens, herbs, some of the statuary that goes with it, that's also trending right now. Oh, interesting. Yeah. A I don't know if it'll, it'll look at home in Michigan, but it's certainly worth a try yeah. if that is your look. I know I just planted a bunch of lavender, which always has that kind of Mediterranean-y kind of look, and I grow a ton of herbs, so maybe I'm ahead of my time, and You're I didn't even know it. ahead of your time. Prime time. And, uh, of course, the U.S. Department of Agriculture first published the Plant Hardiness Zone Map in 1960, but, boy, things are changing, Stacy. and last year in the show we talked about areas of drought and heat, uh, that's going to remain on the radar as we head into 2023. And for folks who don't live in California or let's say Colorado, where they're uh, eliminating uh, some lawn areas or uh, banning the size of sizable lawns and limiting their size, uh, getting paid in order to tear out turf. That's a reality in some parts of the country. It really is. There's all sorts of uh you know, new approaches that are happening. And, um, you know, my personal approach to lawn reduction is I have a lawn. I just don't take care of it. Uh, (laughs) I mean, I mow it. And, and, you know, it's kind of great because it has like a mix of all different wildflowers and and what other people would call weeds in it. Um, But it certainly isn't, you know, taking up water or fertilizer. It's just like, you know, mow it. And then if you're not watering it or fertilizing it, you barely need to mow it. Adriana's nodding because I think she takes the same lawn care approach. And I'm, you know, I'm perfectly good with it because, you know, I'm not doing it for the green manicured golf course lawn. I'm doing it for the birds and the and the insects and all the things that come to my garden, including myself. No lawn in order there. A free spirit. I love it. Now, of course, uh, baby boomers like yours truly. Well, there's a lot of us around. They're beginning to call us super agers because we're living longer. And so gardening trends and gardening and plant material is starting also to kind of suit itself to uh, to some of us uh, super agers. And then as far as those who are younger than, let's say, yours truly, we'll call them down agers. Sure. Good term, right? Down agers. Uh, retro uh, items are also of interest, like retro metal lawn chairs or pagoda umbrellas or tropical plants and cottage gardens. Uh, some of the old time favorites, like lilacs, making a comeback. So that's fun to watch. It is. You know, classics obviously never go out of style. Um, and I have noticed, okay, I'm going to. Does gonna... that make me a classic? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You're never going to go out of style. Uh, and, you know, you can't go wrong with that retro look. I, I love collecting vintage lawn chairs. Oh, yeah. It's fabulous. Yep. Love it. So a lot of trends coming up. We will cover gardening trends and continue to cover them uh, in cov- coming weeks, along with National Plants of the Year. And and Stacy will post uh, this kind of information also on our website in show notes. We can. And if you have a thought on these gardening trends, we'd love to hear from you. You can you can uh, do that. Contact us through uh, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Please do that. Coming up next... We're going to talk about, uh, introduce you to a new plant. It's Plants on Trial. 
Stacy's got a beauty for you. And as a matter of fact, I think this might even fit into my moon garden, which is one of the things on my checklist for gardening this year. Plants on Trial, coming up next. Stay tuned. Greetings, gardeners and gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It is the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, which is to say that we dissect the merits uh, of the plant, tell its story, and, and you can learn what it can do for you, and you decide if you're going to add it to your garden this coming planting season. So today's plant on trial is a brand new one. It's new for 2023, so I thought it was the perfect one. To kick off the new year, it is pufferfish hydrangea. Hmm, there's something fishy about this. <laughs> I'm interested. It is a very unusual name, uh, and that's not uncommon. It for... is an unusual name. It is so fishticated. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you know, I'm, Sorry. I'm surprised I don't see these things coming. It's uh, continue on. Uh, thank Stacey. you. <laughs> uh, but it is actually, uh, and there's a lot of things different about it, not just its name. So. Pana so pufferfish is a panicle hydrangea, uh, and these are also known as PG hydrangeas or hardy hydrangeas, and um, they are extremely easy to grow and one of our specialties. We have uh, a number, I think we have 12 different varieties in the Proven Mentors Color Choice line right now, so quite a few, um, and one of the reasons for that is because they are so popular, panicle hydrangeas. You know, they grow over a huge range of North America from very cold climates to very hot areas, extremely, extremely showy. I mean, yeah. you can't drive around in July or August without, oh. you know, seeing one. And for people keeping score at home, uh, for people who say, hey, I have difficulty growing hydrangeas. No, panicle hydrangeas, you can grow. Yes, this is one that anyone can grow. It's practically foolproof. Um, and so for us, you know, having so many panicle hydrangeas in the line right now, it was going to take something really special to, you know, be added to the line and increase our selection. And puffer fish is special in many ways. So first of all, it's a semi-dwarf variety. Now, we were just talking about how easy it is to grow panicle hydrangeas and how anyone can grow them. But uh, heretofore, they've been a little bit difficult for a lot of people to fit into their yard because they were big plants, six to eight feet at a minimum and over, you know, 20 years or more, they can get to be 20 feet tall easily. Wow. And wow. they're long lived. So they, they got really big. And so we've been focusing on introducing smaller varieties. So pufferfish uh, weighs in at a cool three to five feet tall and wide. So a very nice, easy size to use. And it has those white kind of ice cream cone flowers that people associate with panicle hydrangeas, but they're kind of more loose and open. So it's not a lace cap, but it does have a lacy look. They are very full, uh, but the flowers aren't really densely packed. They're kind of open. So it just has this really beautiful open look. So well, I'm, I'm interested, Stacy. how did this plant get its name? Why do you call it puffer fish? I mean, I know it's official that... This plant is a hit, and it's new, and it's fabulous, but why the name Pufferfish? Well, it's all about the flowers. So those flowers I was just describing, they do have kind of that rounded, almost like a puffed up puffer, pufferfish kind of look, and that was where the name originally came from. But it also has this one quirky little habit, um, and I'm going to say this, and so you're going to have to use your imagination, but has, so the flowers open in, say, like mid-July here in Michigan, and they're doing their thing, looking great, and then just as the flowers start to age a little bit into August, this little spurt of florets comes out the top, of fresh white florets, so <laughs> it's almost like a fish squirting water. <laughs> that's that's honestly where the name comes from. I don't know if puffer fish actually squirt out water because they're full of air, not water. Otherwise, of course, they would sink and not float. Um, but it, it's almost like if you just imagine a, a fish coming up to the, the surface and squirting out a little water, that's a lot of what it looks like. Wow. Fabulous. It, it's it's a quirky little uh, feature, but uh, quirky is good. Quirky is definitely good, and you know it's you're probably thinking of this just on one inflorescence or one flower right now, but really over the whole plant, it, it just creates this extremely unique, um, engaging textural look that you kind of have to see to believe. And we've got plenty of pictures of it, and of course we'll put those in the show notes at Gardening Simplified on air.com. So the, the round puffiness of the flowers and that funny little 
spurt of flowers, it florets at the end. That's what gives it the name pufferfish. And we'll put a picture of this, of course, uh, oh, on yeah. the website so you can check it out. And I'm just racking my brain trying to come up with pufferfish puns. So if you think of one of those, drop us a line. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll take it hook and sinker. Yeah. <laughs> So in addition uh, to those great features, it does something that no other panicle hydrangea that we currently offer does. And that is that the flowers, the white flowers, do not turn color as they age. So uh, most panicle hydrangeas, the flowers open in, say, July or early August. They're, they're white to cream to green. And then as the nights start to get a little bit cooler later in August, they turn pink, they turn red, burgundy, all of these colors. Now, a lot of people love that. A lot of people actually get them and say, hey, when's this thing going to turn pink? I wanted it to be pink. Mm -hmm. But believe it or not, a lot of people do not like that. They want it to stay white. Uh, it goes with their color scheme. And sure. what we've heard uh, from a lot of professional landscapers is they really want that white color because it's more predictable. If they design a landscape... Uh, you know, they have a specific idea, color scheme in mind, and all of a sudden this plant starts taking on these wacky purple and or, you know pink and red tones, and they're like, hey, whoa, whoa, this wasn't my intent. So this has that nice predictability where it starts out white, goes to cream, and then it's kind of like a creamy green color through fall. So it's, it's really quite attractive, and especially for people who want moon gardens and want to keep that nice bright white color through September and the harvest moon, um, it would be a really, really nice choice for the garden. So it's ideal for my moon garden. One of the things we talked about in trends during the first segment. And Stacy, I would, uh, one of the things I would ask you is on panicle hydrangeas, sometimes those blooms can get so large and maybe a little weighty too when they're wet. How are yeah. the stems on puffer fish? So that's a great question. And uh, I can say that they are very sturdy. Sturdy stems and early blooming are the two main factors that we look for in panicle hydrangeas at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Because those are the things that people, if they had a complaint about this wonderful, super easy to grow plant, it's that it blooms too late. Uh, especially if you live in a more northern climate, it, you know, older varieties might not be even bloom until late August. And that older varieties also would flop over. And these do not, especially if you prune them properly. And I know I'm opening a whole can of worms uh, <laughs> by talking about hydrangea pruning. Oh, can of worms. Good, good one. <laughs> I was Pufferfish. thinking you might make some connection there. I don't know if pufferfish eat worms. but um, I don't either. But panicle hydrangeas are really no-brainers to prune. All you have to do, they bloom on new wood, so you do want to prune them in spring. And all you have to do is cut them back by about one third their total height and take off any thin side branches at that time. Okay. And what that does is it, uh, first of all, uh, forces the plant's new growth for the coming year to come from bigger, thicker buds that were set lower down on the stem. So if you think about how a plant grows through the season, you know, uh, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing. By the time August comes around, the days are getting short. It's starting to get a little bit cool. And the growth that the plant is creating in August is not as, as thick or as vigorous as the stuff that it created a month or two earlier. Okay. So if we prune this back by a third, what we do is we take all of those buds that were formed at the end of the season that didn't have the full advantage of time and great conditions to mature, we take those off. Okay. And we're forcing the plant to just grow from that healthier, more vigorous growth that it created earlier in the season. And by doing that, that growth that comes out is going to be, you know, thick and vigorous and really, really strong. So it does have inherently stronger stems, but also by practicing proper pruning, which you will find at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. We'll have lots of resources there for you because I know this is an eternal question and one that we will answer over and over again uh, on Gardening Simplified Show. Um but really strong stems. This is just a fantastic, fantastic choice uh, for really any landscape. It will easily take full sun here in Michigan or in cooler climates. If you live in a warmer area, you're going to want some afternoon shade if you can get it. But I tell you, pufferfish hydrangea is going to be the one to watch in garden centers oh, this year. I'm excited about it. Pufferfish. So pufferfish, panicle hydrangeas, folks. And we're going to put the uh, link information there, as we do every week in the show notes at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. And Stacy, it checks all the boxes. You can fit it into a tight spot, 
uh, relatively low maintenance and uh, fits into our moon garden. So it's check, check, check. I love it. Especially once you see those pictures. So definitely do go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com to see that and see what a little spurt of florets coming from at the end of the flower really well, looks like. A spurt of florets, but isn't a puffer fish a blowfish? Is that yeah. what they call them? Mm-hmm. It's a blowfish. Yeah, yeah, I guess that just didn't have quite the uh, the ring to it as puffer fish. So puffer you know, fish it is. When a blowfish works out, it gets really puff. Puff. <laughs> okay. Puff. And with that. <laughs> take it away. We have to take a tiny little break here, but then we're going to be back with your questions. Uh, and uh, we look forward to... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just came to mind. I'm sorry. Uh, you got to keep that in there, Adriana. <laughs> and with that, we need to take a little break, but we will be back in just a moment with your gardening questions. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's that time of the day where we answer your gardening questions. That's one of the ways that we simplify gardening on this show. And so if you have a gardening quandary or conundrum that's been keeping you up at night or as spring approaches that you're frantic to get an answer on, we would love to hear from you so we can answer your question on air. All you have to do is email help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. There's a contact form there. You can even attach a picture, which is always so helpful in uh, helping people with their gardening questions. So what do we got in the mailbag today, Rick? Stacy uh, Pam writes to us, we just bought a new house and there's a beautiful Japanese dwarf red maple that has grown quite a lot. Can this be pruned to contain the growth? Specifically, can I prune some small branches off the top? A Japanese dwarf red maple. So, uh, yes, you can. That's a short answer, uh, Pam. But, the uh, you know, it's, it's a little nerve-wracking for people who don't know what they're doing to prune a Japanese maple because they are expensive. Uh, they are quite expensive plants to start off with. And um, because, you know, it's uh, people, they, they know that they're beautiful and they don't want to make a mistake that's going to permanently disfigure their Japanese maple. So my first piece of advice to Pam and anyone who's looking to prune a Japanese maple is uh, less is more. Definitely don't make any cuts until you're absolutely sure uh, that they are the right cut to do. And... Um, try to prune it. So when we talk about pruning, uh, most of the time we're talking about pruning shrubs. Like we were just talking about pruning puffer fish panicle hydrangea. And in that case, you're just cutting the branch off, cutting it, leaving a little stump at the end. With Japanese maples, they are trees. Even though they're a little bit shrub-like, you want to treat them like you're pruning a tree instead of a shrub. So what that means is that basically you generally want to avoid shortening the branches. You want to cut out entire branches obviously, if you can do so without disfiguring it. So um, not necessarily like a main branch or the trunk, but any of those smaller branches coming off. You don't want to just, you know, trim it with a hedge trimmer or something like that. That would truly be a travesty to a beautiful Japanese maple. Yeah, absolutely. And my suggestion would be uh, consider doing it when the tree is dormant, when the foliage is off the tree, you're going to get a better look. You're going to do a better job of what Stacy just described. And boy, I endorse that fully, uh, Stacy, you are correct in that. And then also um, identify what type of Japanese maple it is. There are many different types of Japanese maples. Some have an upright growing habit and some are pendulating or pendula type right. Japanese yep. maples. And uh, so that's going to also affect the uh, the approach that you take. You know who loves Japanese maples? Who's that? Our producer, Adriana. Does she really? <laughs> She's crazy about that. I was yeah. wondering why she was over there smiling, <laughs> grinning ear to ear. She loves Japanese. She's maples. on her way to becoming a Japanese maple expert. So yeah, Pam, absolutely now or you know, late February, early March, those first couple warm days, that would be an ideal time to go in through and do this. And I would say give yourself plenty of time. You know, try not to do it in a rushed way. Make sure that each decision that you're making about what you're going to prune is considered, not just in what it's going to look like, but how it's going to affect the tree 
in the long term. But I do find that skillful pruning of Japanese maples can absolutely uh, make the difference between a nice specimen and a fabulous one. And the idea behind skillful pruning here is skillful pruning to have it look as beautiful as it's meant to be. But relax odds are you're not going to kill it. Many times right. people think, I'm going to kill this thing by pruning it. You're not. Go ahead and do it. Uh, but uh, a little skillful pruning will add to the look of the plant. Stacy uh, Izar sent us an email saying, hey there, I'm gardening in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Which viburnum is evergreen for me? Thank you for the show. I'm following your podcast and YouTube show and enjoy them both. Thank you, Izar. We appreciate that greatly. And thanks for sending us a question. Uh, he's asking about viburnum that's evergreen. Yes. So there are a number of evergreen viburnums out there. However, the ones that are hardy for us here in Michigan, uh, that's a much smaller number. Uh, the most showy and beautiful and interesting ones are definitely like a zone seven or warmer kind of plant. You've got your David viburnum, which you see all over on the West Coast and some in the East or in some uh, in the South, rather. Um, there's Awabuki viburnum, which is just a beautiful um, glossy leafed viburnum. They're, they're really nice. But for us here in the North, there's the, the, the choices are, are, are a bit slimmer, but still really nice. Uh, and the first one that comes to mind, and I'm sure you're familiar with it, Rick, is leatherleaf viburnum. Yes. Viburnum. Love it. Yeah, I love it too. Viburnum ritidophyllum. Uh, and it's called leatherleaf. It is evergreen, and the leaves on it are very dark green, very thick, and what's known as rugose, so that they have that kind of like corrugated, deeply corrugated texture. Good word. Rugose. <laughs> yes. Rugos. It is a good word. Um, and they have like a thick kind of hair on the back. And it's, I think, a, a nice specimen of leatherleaf viburnum is absolutely beautiful. And the nice thing about it, very, very shade tolerant as well. well just the texture alone. Texture in the garden is so important. So fabulous suggestion. Yes. And the the texture that it brings to the garden as well as the texture that you feel yourself yeah. when, when you're touching it. Um, very deer resistant too. And I know I have friends who live in Ann Arbor and they have... They have deer problems that rival mine. <laughs> so if that's an issue for you is our uh, good news there. The other one um, is kind of more semi-evergreen, and that's a lantanophyllum viburnum. Yes, love that one too. Very nice. Um, but depending on the winter we have, it might not be entirely evergreen. If we have a really severe winter, what you're going to find is probably just it. it's semi-evergreen, which means it keeps the leaves at its tips, but loses its inner leaves to come back the following spring. So those are probably the two choices that you will find here uh, at a local garden center in Michigan. Wow. For a evergreen viburnum. That's great. Well rooted advice. Really well done. That I hope that helps you out, uh, Izar. And and uh, thanks for your appreciation of viburnums too, because we uh, we love viburnums. And Stacy, you mentioned zone seven or warmer uh, in our gardening trends. We talked about the USDA hardiness map, and I'm going to guess Ann Arbor is probably a uh, five to six something yeah, I'd say like probably that. Probably a six A. Yeah. All right, great. And then uh, Dixie sends us an email, says the other day I saw on Facebook an idea to plant a pine cone in a bowl and little pine cones or pine trees rather will sprout from it. Some people in the comments say that hey, it's not going to work and I'm wondering if it's worth trying. Yeah, so I saw this too, Dixie, uh, on Facebook. And um, I also saw the comments and, you know, I, everyone's an expert in social <laughs> everyone's media. An ex exactly. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people said it won't work. Um, and I think it's the, the varied uh, comments, the, the array of comments that you saw are due to the fact that it's hard to actually generalize about pine cones. Um, first of all, if you find one on the ground, almost certainly all the seeds are out of it. Um, so just walking around and picking one up is probably not going to, to work because they only drop them after they have, you know, the seeds have matured and, and flew, flown away or the squirrels have taken them, which you see a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, if you're going to do this, you want a ripe pine cone. So one that's kind of hard and dry, but from on the tree. 
Yes. As a matter of fact, when the DNR has its pine cone collection sometime in September or whatever, that's what they advise people to do. The lower branches on the tree. Yep. Yeah. So that's the first reason it wouldn't work. And then the second reason is it's probably going to depend on the type of pine that you have. Some pines need a cold period to germinate their seeds um, and some do not. So uh, you don't necessarily know if the pine cone that you're trying to do this with has been through that cold treatment or if it even needs it. And unfortunately, there's no, you know, clearing house that we can go to and, and get all of this information in one tidy place and help you achieve success. But I would say it is worth trying. If the question here is, is it worth experimenting with? Yes, it is. Just try to look for um, pine cones off the tree. And as you walk around, take them from a variety of different uh, you know, species or types of yes. pines um, so that point. you increase your chances of it working. Now, I saw this picture. It is a really fun idea. Overall, there's not much to be lost as long as, you know, not much less to be in trying it, um, as long as you don't beat yourself up if it doesn't work because it, it's not you, Dixie. It would be the pine cone. I think that's great advice. Dixie, thanks so much for your question. We pine for your approval. So keep those questions coming. Send them to us at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Thanks, Rick. And we are going to be back in just a moment with branching news. So please stay tuned. Welcome back, folks, to the Gardening Simplified Show. And in this segment, we do branching news. It's not breaking news. It's branching news. And yet, wow, look at this. We do have breaking news today, an item that's gone viral on social media. Stacy WBIR 10 News in Tennessee uh, did a story on Catherine Reddick, who came home from work and was amazed to see a fluorescent yellow cardinal on her bird feeder. What? Took a grainy picture with her phone. Next day, excited, brings it to work, and no one really seemed excited about it. And, like, that was a bummer. So the next day, she waited with her better camera, took a great shot of a beautiful yellow cardinal, posted it in social media, and the rest is history uh, it went viral. So they've named this Yellow Cardinal Woodstock by online fans. And uh, experts, I thought it was interesting, experts were estimating there are only about a dozen of these birds that have a genetic mutation, uh, Yellow Cardinals. I would freak out. So would I. <laughs> I mean, I I'd would love freak it. out. <laughs> Incredible. I would love to see something like that. And, of course, she's had so many shares and... Uh, they're saying the coloration probably comes from that genetic mutation. It doesn't turn the pigments from the bird's diet into red, but instead into yellow, creating that vibrant yellow color. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, I was going to do a book on genetic mutations in birds. I figured it would fly off the shelf, but maybe someday I'll do that. In the uh, fall of 1968, have you ever heard of this, Stacy? There was the Great Squirrel Migration. I have not. And as a squirrel fan, I find that embarrassing. Well, we're going to post that on the uh, in the show notes. But I guess in 1968, it was a force of nature unlike anything we've seen before. Gray squirrels in mass moving by the thousands out of the woods, crossing mountains, rivers, highways. Newspapers were publishing accounts of squirrels swimming across and often drowning in bodies of water, sizable amounts of squirrels or roadkill, uh, because the animals had run out of fur and they migrated to other areas. So there was a bountiful year for acorns in 1967. The squirrel population ballooned, and then in 1968, the Great Migration took place. So th where did they migrate to? They Just migrated to other forest areas okay. further north oh. from the south. And it's a fascinating thing. As a matter of fact, I, pick, I picked up on this uh, on Mental Floss. And so we have the link for you. We're going to put it at the website. We'd love to have you visit because it's a great read. The Great Squirrel Migration of, uh, of 1968. So I'm going out on a limb here and saying that you're, you'll enjoy this story as much as I did. And I know you love squirrels, right, Stacy? I'm nuts about them. Yeah. So there, you know... <laughs> Really, Rick? Amazing. <laughs> Not even a giggle? <laughs> Sorry. 
Yes, outstanding. <laughs> Very well done. Oh, boy. See, I realize, uh, yeah, with squirrels, you are what you eat, nuts. And that's what squirrels are. They act nuts. Uh, but well done. Thank you. Uh, they're digging in my yard right now. Are they doing the same? Oh, yeah. For you? Yeah. They've they're got, making a mess. They, yeah. Well, I have a suet feeder that they are making abundant use of. Very fun. I positioned it in such a way that they have to do major acrobatics. I didn't try. I was trying to feed the birds, but the squirrels have to do these acrobatics to get to the, the suet feeder, and it's quite entertaining. Um, and I also put up a squirrel feeder, one of those little mini picnic Fantastic. tables. So Fantastic. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I dig it when a linguistics major does puns. I love that, Stacy. Well done. Homes with uh, huge trees in the front yard. Just a comment. Uh, you know, sometimes you drive by a home where the tree in the front yard just dwarfs everything else, just a gigantic tree. And they leave that tree there. And I saw one on Zillow, which is a real estate uh, type of website. And so we're going to put the link so you can check that out at the website uh, too. Just a massive, massive tree. Um, I have been to those kinds of gardens before. Probably the most impressive one I have been to is Marsha Donahue's garden in Berkeley, California. And she opens it to the public on the weekends. And you cannot even see her house for the giant tree that's in front of it. Yeah. And when you part the leaves and you go in, you just enter this most magical, amazing garden. She's an artist, and it's all full of her ceramics and unusual plants. And uh, one of the most memorable garden experiences I've had. Beautiful. Beautiful. Fun to look at, and we'll put the link there on the website. So, Stacy, the faculty of, I put this in here for you because you're a word expert. The faculty of Lake Superior State University releases its annual list of words that they say deserve to be banished from our vocabularies over misuse, overuse, and uselessness. And uh, the first list and the most banished word of the year was goat. Oh. Goat. Greatest of all time. Yeah, that thing finds its roots with the uh, NFL quarterback, Tom Brady, GOAT. Uh, so uh, that's one on their list. Inflection point, quiet quitting, moving forward, amazing. I know I say that word too often, and I shouldn't say that word as often as I do. Amazing. Or does that make sense? Or irregardless, that's oh, a favorite. Yeah. Irregardless, Ooh. that's a bad one. Strikes a chord, absolutely and it is what it is. They're oh. looking to banish that uh, also. Well, you know, I was a linguistics major, but I'm not the language police. And, you know, <laughs> language needs to, there are rules, but, you know, it's it's there to be understood. And if you're being understood, then not even the people at Lake Superior State University can tell you that you shouldn't be using those words. I'm except still... for maybe irregardless. <laughs> yes, except for, of course. I, uh, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around rugos. I really like that. I thought rugos was that sauce I put on my spaghetti at home when I'm making spaghetti. Rugos. Remind us again. Rugos. Rugos. It means like it's, uh, corrugated or has like a thick kind of, uh, bumpy texture. I love sort of. that. As a, uh, a person who spends a lot of time in the garden, I got to make sure that one's stuck in my head. That's very rugos. And, yep. uh, and in our first segment, and by the way, folks, make sure you tune in every week because you learn stuff like this. The, uh, the columnar shape was? Vestigit. There you go. Amazing. It's awesome. All right. The, uh, uh, the British have a Shed of the Year competition. Now, that's another gardening trend, uh, these uh, sheds that uh, people will doctor up and dress up and, and put all kinds of cool things in their shed, kind of an uh, auxiliary living area sure. in their yard. And they have this contest in Britain. It's put on by Cuprinol, the, uh, the paint or stain people. Kelly Hayworth is this year's winner, 2022. Uh, she built the shed entirely out of secondhand materials it's the first time in the 16 years of the competition that a budget category entry has won the top prize. So that's pretty neat. She made the entire shed out of old doors, pallet wood, recycled materials that she found on Facebook Marketplace, and it took five weeks to complete, and, uh, and she won the, the grand prize. So pretty cool. Yeah, definitely one to check out on the show notes at Gardening Simplified on air.com. Yeah, I did look at it. It's very cool. It she is did a cool. very, very good job. Being, uh, you know, separate from her home, 
Uh, the shed has all the comforts. It has a kitchenette, a potting area, a tool storage, and a composting toilet. Oh. A composting toilet, really. So it kind of, it's an outhouse, too, to a degree. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All Very in cool. one. Everything there you, you could want. <laughs> there you go. Well, Happy New Year, uh, Stacy, and, and we want to really encourage people to uh, subscribe and watch us on YouTube and get the podcast and share it with friends and neighbors because uh, I have a funny feeling that this year is going to be a kick in the plants. I think it already is. We're off to a great start. I'm looking forward to it. Look for Gardening Simplified on air.com and send us uh, your pictures and your comments also. Please do that. We love it when you do that. Have yourself a great week. We'll talk to you next week.